Welcome back to New Rock Stars. I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of 2014's X Men Days of Future Past. This is the seventh installment of our X Men Snick Snick Rewatch. As we go back through all 13 of Fox X Men and Deadpool films ahead of Wolverine's Mutant Homecoming and Deadpool and Wolverine in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. At this point, the X Men franchise had split into a Matthew Vaughn reboot era and the Wolverine spinoff era. And this movie was designed to tie both eras together and really restore the X Men franchise. And it resulted in one of the best installments with ingenious time travel mechanics and memorable moments. That Marvel Studios would even circle back to. So let's break down Days of Future Past scene by scene for all the Easter eggs, details never spotted, the implications of the crazy time travel mechanics, and stuff that could come back in Deadpool and Wolverine. Now, Fox actually released two versions of this movie, the regular theatrical cut and an alternate version dubbed the Rogue Cut with an additional 17 minutes of footage mostly centering around Anna Paquin's Rogue, including a rescue mission with Charles and Bobby and Magneto from the X-Mansion that's been turned into a Department of Defense facility, and it would have been Rogue instead of Kitty Pride reunited with Logan in the final act. We're gonna talk about both versions of this movie in this breakdown. In the opening fanfare, we get the return of the lingering X in the Fox logo as it fades to black, something that they started to do away with after the original three films, but also there's a bit of the X-Men musical score playing at the end of the normal Fox music if you listen closely. So we open on post-apocalyptic New York City. Like the first two films, Patrick Stewart narrating is Charles Xavier, but it's scary. A dark, desolate world. Notice how Central Park has been turned into a mutant internment camp with mutants marched in with M's branded on their faces. In a way, this parallels the openings to X-Men 2000 and X-Men First Class. Another generation, another extermination of an oppressed group. Magneto was right. The worst of humanity will always bear out. And using M's this way reminds us of House of M comics, where Scarlet Witch creates a reality where Magneto rules a society where mutants and superpowered people are the dominant class. In Multiverse of Madness, in the 838 universe, New York Central Park will be home to the Baxter Foundation. So maybe that universe's Charles chose this park for his refuge to correct the horrible way it was used in this universe. So the film Days of Future Past, which we can acknowledge is a completely nonsensical and ridiculous but awesome title, is based on number 141 to 142 of Uncanny X-Men, which was the original X-Men run written by Chris Claremont, who might be the all-time best writer of X-Men comics. He also did the Dark Phoenix saga. He has a cameo later in this movie. This comic also opened in future New York City, although that mentioned time travel from the year 2013. The opening of this film is set in 2023. We get that number from Charles's speech later where he says like it was 1973 and then 50 years since is how they perfected Sentinel technology. So, you know, you get 2023 from that. But in the comics, there was only four surviving X-Men at this point. Kitty Pride, Wolverine, Storm, and Colossus. The Days of Future Past comics were also adapted for the animated series and there are some similarities to what we're seeing here, like mutants being marched through and handed over to Sentinels. The hellscape that we are now seeing is very similar to the post-apocalyptic landscape that opens the Terminator films, down to the charred bones of torched mutants Terminator director James Cameron was actually consulted for this movie to discuss time travel and string theory and the multiverse as it's displayed in fiction. Among these detained mutants, there is an older Ink with a tattoo on his face. He actually shows up later in 1973 as a teenager. There's also an older Sabretooth, an older Quicksilver. In the comics and in the animated series, Bishop also had an M on his face. He came from a different timeline, but in this movie, the fact that he has an M on his face makes it seem like he was at one point detained, but he broke free. According to Simon Kinberg, who wrote this movie, the mutant credited only as Young Mutant Scavenger is supposed to be Nate Gray. He was a super powerful mutant from the comics that Mr. Sinister created using DNA from Scott and Jean. Here he moves among the bones and bodies and is killed by a sentinel that finds him. We stay on his face as it lights up from sentinel opening its mouth and we zoom in on the X and the camera swoops down through strands of DNA and they change and adapt. But unlike the mutant X gene DNA, there's this mechanical element to these changes since what we're really seeing is the sentinel's ability to adapt to any mutant threat. And we arrive at the X door of Cerebro and we open in Moscow that's been ravaged by war and just these depressed pressing construction grids erected over the older buildings in a vain attempt to preserve their history. Now, the film that preceded this was The Wolverine. In that movie's post credit scene, Magneto and Charles were working together to stop this sentinel threat. Clearly, they failed, but we saw how far in advance they were fighting to prevent this exact future from coming to pass, and they still failed. I always find it interesting coming out of that movie that Yukio sensed this apocalyptic darkness falling over the world, and I wonder if it was this that she was seeing. So the sentinels deploy from these cold, floating Kubrickian monoliths as like a symbol of evil technology, but they operate operate like drone insects. We learn later that all sentinels are linked in a kind of hive mind, like a power absorbed by one of them is a power gained by all. And it's just kind of an interesting thematic statement for this movie, right? It's not really their ability to adapt and change that makes them powerful. It's the fact that they're all just kind of linked together and don't have to question that. And the real challenge of this movie is, can mutants 
through time, change each other's hearts and connect for the greater good. These surviving mutants include James Proudstar, Warpath. He's super strong in his heightened senses, which is why he is the one who stands lookout for the Sentinels. There's Clarice Ferguson, aka Blink, who can create portals from one place to another. There's Kitty Pride, Elliot Page returning for the role. Bishop, he can absorb and store energy. There's Colossus, played once more by Daniel Cudmore. Iceman, Bobby Drake, played again by Sean Ashmore. And Roberto da Costa, aka Sunspot, who can absorb solar energy and turn himself into a kind of miniature sun to project heat waves outward. A different Sunspot will be in the new Mutants film. But Sunspot in this movie is kind of taking the place of Pyro. But Aaron Stanford Pyro is confirmed to return in Deadpool and Wolverine. So this group calls themselves the Free Mutants, and their uniforms feel kind of like a throwback to the original movies. The black leather, the colored highlights. Like the surviving humans of the Matrix films, they have to move from place to place as they're kind of hunted by AI machines and they escape by the skin of their teeth. But I like how they've gotten this routine on lock. Bishop has Sunspot charge him up, and I like how Bishop doesn't even slow running as Kitty touches him to phase through stuff last minute. Now the Sentinels here have a different design than they have in the comics or in the animated series, or even from the brief glimpse that we got in the Danger Room in The Last Stand. Production designer John Meyer described the design of the Sentinels as having evolved from machines into biomechanical weapons, saying, quote, they are almost made of mechanical plates slapped over one another, imagining that the plates could contract or grow so that the Sentinel can be skinny to get through a small space, or the plates can open up to become a bigger shape. They have become virtually unstoppable, the ultimate version that can actually, in principle, stop the X-Men. And the idea of the plates kind of collapsing like scales is rooted all the way back in the original VFX design of Mystique in the 2000 film, where the way they had her shapeshift was just like scales turning over each other. It's just so cool to see those little production design elements work their way back through the film franchise. As they fight, Bobby shifts into his ice form that he discovered back in X3. The Sentinels keep adapting based on previous run-ins with the other mutants. So this one fighting Colossus adapts in real time as it grabs him and mimics his steel-like power. In the Rogue cut, it's actually explained that they're able to absorb the powers thanks to Rogue. So they're using Rogue's powers and Mystique's DNA together to absorb and adapt. So this way, it kind of shows that the most dangerous mutants, at least to all of them collectively, are Rogue and Mystique. And since the Sentinels are all connected, as Sunspot fights one, it turns to ice, something it can do because the other Sentinel at the same time is fighting Iceman. And as Sunspot uses his powers, the one fighting Iceman mimics his power. The Sentinels are just doing exactly what Magneto warned humanity would do to turn mutants' abilities against each other. And what we see is just incredibly bleak. The Sentinel uses Sunspot's heat to melt Iceman. It snaps off his head and then stomps on it. The Sentinels adapt to Blink's power, figuring out her portal logic and stabbing her through one right as it's closing to put an end to it. Now, it's not clear what this facility is, but all the Cyrillic signage is just generic storage and safety signs. Wonder if those tanks contain nuclear waste? Like somewhere the free mutants thought the Sentinels wouldn't look? Remember, Sebastian Shaw in first class assumed that all mutants were immune to radiation as children of the atom? Kitty displaces Bishop's consciousness back in time to warn themselves. In the animated series, Bishop was the first one to go back in time to warn the X-Men, but this normally is not part of Shadowcat's power set. In the comics, it was Rachel Summers, who is Scott and Jean's daughter, and Franklin Richards, who send Kitty's mind back in time. Rachel Summers was in an earlier draft of this movie, but writer Simon Kimberg decided to make this just part of Kitty's powers. In past videos, I have described this type of time travel as Type 7, Unstuck Mind Time Travel, aka Consciousness Displacement. It's how time travel works in Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse 5, and how it works with the character Desmond in Lost. It is my favorite type of time travel. I actually wrote a screenplay that none of you are ever going to read that uses Consciousness Displacement Time Travel. None of you are ever going to read it because it sucks. But I just like the idea that this is what time travel is for us as we watch movies. Like, our mind just kind of drifts back to past eras of our life as we relive our trauma or our victories. So we find ourselves back in a new form of Cerebro. This is a portable one used by Charles and it looks awesome. As in X2, mutants are depicted in red and humans depicted in white. One of them is getting killed executioner style, kind of like that infamous Viet Cong photograph. And we see a mutant mother clutching her mutant child. On this hollow projected interface, you can see the word longitude. So from Charles's point of view, these mutants just keep hopping location via blink every time Bishop sneezes and tells the others, shit, we gotta run. It's just crazy to imagine each time these other mutants, Iceman, Sunspot, Colossus, Blink, Warpath, they all fight and die to Sentinels not knowing whether Bishop and Kitty would be successful. So they just kind of face death openly with nothing but a prayer. And each time they do this for them, it is their first and only time they face Sentinels and die. Only Bishop would remember each round of deaths. That is a lot to carry. Now, theoretically, Bishop probably told them that Sentinels can absorb and gain their powers, but it'd just be impossible for mutants like Bobby and Colossus to really practice that. So each time Bishop is kind of telling them these ghost stories of the threat that's eventually going to come and kill them, but he has to just say, trust me, in the multiverse, another version of you will never experience this. So they find this new refuge in an ancient temple in the mountains of China. And yes, on screen, they do label this as China, not Tibet, because the studio didn't want to take any chances with Chinese distribution. The Blackbird jet now seems to be powered by a new form of energy and arrives with Storm, a cigar smoking Wolverine, Charles in an ergonomic hover chair, 
in Magneto. Hugh Jackman is the only actor who appeared in all the films up until this point. He actually holds a record for an actor who appeared as the same character in the most times in a superhero movie. He actually has some gray on his temples, so our man does age, or it's just been a stressful few years. Kitty and Bobby hold hands, their romance carried over from that subplot in X3, even though that movie ended with Bobby and Rogue together, but in the alter timeline of the end of this movie, we see Rogue and Bobby still together, whereas Kitty and Colossus are teaching a class together as the characters are linked together in the comics. Kitty explains how they stay ahead of the Sentinels, and Charles provides the other piece of the puzzle for this movie's plan, the historical origin of the Sentinel program. The February 1972 issue of Popular Mechanics with Boulevard Trask on the cover includes the headline that it reads, The Spy Plane We Don't Talk About, which could be a little nod to the Blackbird. Coming from the success of Game of Thrones, Peter Dinklage was cast as Boulevard Trask. Bill Duke played a different Trask in X-Men The Last Stand. We see Trask looking over studies of mutant experiments, ones that we get a better look at later, but we just see their fish-like anatomies, their deformed skin as he was experimenting on them like their animals. Charles says that Mystique learned what Trask was doing, and he recalls how he and Raven grew up together. So it's just kind of nice to hear from Patrick Stewart's mouth confirming the events that we saw in First Class as part of his history. Charles says Raven assassinated Trask at the 1973 Paris Peace Accords, but was captured, and in a cruel twist of fate, her DNA was used to perfect Sentinel technology. And it's implied that Mystique's capture and her DNA harvested was part of the character's history, even in the 2000 and 2003 film. Does it make sense that the government wouldn't be more protected from a known shapeshifter posing as their senators and DHS secretaries? No, but just don't think about it. Kitty says that she can only send a mind back a few weeks, maybe a month, but any further would rip a mind apart. And Logan says, What if someone's mind has a way of snapping back? He's referring to his healing power, but this could also explain why Logan could heal past Stryker's adamantium bullet to remember things from before that shot. But it would also mean that Logan would remember how confusing X-Men Origins left the timeline for at least the first part of this movie, with alternate versions of young Scott and, you know, that creepy younger walking Charles. So a quick snap this elephant's mind back to the past so we can eat Charles Sunshine and all that nonsense. It's fun to just laugh about it, but what I think this movie does so elegantly is it just kind of contains all of that Elseworld multiverse stuff within the minds of Logan and Charles Xavier. And we just get to look at the beautiful faces of Hugh Jackman and Patrick Stewart and always wonder, well, at the very least, it stays in their mind. And that's what made them coming back and dying in Logan such a fitting end, because all of that would die with them. But now at least one of them is back in Deadpool and Wolverine. But it just kind of makes their minds like Pandora's boxes of everything weird that happened in the X-Men movies. But this whole idea of consciousness time travel would be less familiar to audiences in 2014. So this line from Pity really neatly establishes the stakes of the film. Whatever you've done will take hold and become history. And for the rest of us, it'll be the only history that we know. So think about it, they are all so desperate and so beleaguered by their current reality that they're willing to just wash it all away for who knows what. The deleted scene would have shown Wolverine kissing Storm goodbye before he undergoes a mind transference procedure. In the comics, the two were sometimes romantically linked, and in the animated series, they were married in an alternate timeline. Wolverine, do not worry. You are stuck with me a little longer. Oh, you know it, darling. Halle Berry was originally supposed to have a much larger role in Days of Future Past, but it was cut down because of her pregnancy. So Katie blasts Logan's temples and its adamantium claws come out. Now, 2013's The Wolverine ended with Logan's adamantium claws being chopped off by Silver Samurai, and he ended the movie with bone claws. When asked how Logan got his adamantium back, director Brian Singer shrugged that Logan was just friends with Magneto, implying that Magneto would have grafted adamantium back on his claws. But really, the shot was just to establish a visual contrast to distinguish the present Wolverine from the 1973 Wolverine. And we flash to white, and we wake up seeing this lava lamp which for a moment makes us think we're seeing brain cells that are just kind of snapping back into consciousness. As he did in the 2013 movie, Logan just kind of wakes up disoriented. The song playing on the radio as he wakes up is Roberta Flax, the first time I ever saw your face. The gray is gone from his hair now. He's also buck-ass naked. One-upping the MCU strand of male nudity. We get butt here, guys. But this was Jackman's idea. The script originally called for him to be wearing boxers, but he said, in Australia, if you're next to a really good looking girl, you're not getting out with boxer shorts on or briefs or anything. Really, I just think Hugh Jackman wanted to show off the insane physique he got into again for this movie because later when he buckles his belt notice that his pecs twitch again come on Hugh now when he looks outside the billboard of the man smoking was actually a real billboard in Times Square in the 70s and the Times Square news ticker reads Brezhnev calls for which is probably a nod to the Soviet leader Brezhnev and Richard Nixon's peace and disarmament talks during this detente period on the wall are some samurai swords and a framed picture of Mount Fuji which could be a nod to his past and future in Japan from the events of the Wolverine the striped brown and yellow curtains that he has are all also reminiscent of his uncanny X-Men 139 suit that he got in an alternate post credit scene from that film. And I just love this retro revolver wallpaper. I'm just digging this pad. We learn that he's sleeping with the boss's daughter, Gwen, and she calls him Jimmy. So yeah, he is going by his birth name, James Hellett. This would be before his weapons plus procedure, so he still has bone claws. He accidentally nicks the waterbed, reminding us of his clumsiness with his adamantium claws in the bathroom in X-Men Origins. So after killing that last goon, he catches the keys and he says, 
peaceful thoughts. It's such a fun mantra for Logan in 1973. The Vietnam War was coming to an end and the Cold War was cooling down during the detente period. America was just kind of giving peace a chance and so is Logan trying in this movie. This might be the least violent we see Wolverine in a movie. In the Senate meeting with Trask, there are two cameos from X-Men comic writers. Congressman Parker is Chris Claremont. Maybe he chose the name Parker as like a nod to Peter Parker. He's the one who wrote the Days of Future Past comic and was brought on for the film as a consultant. The other cameo is from Lynn Wine, who created the character of Wolverine. Now, Senator Brickman is played by Michael Lerner. He's in a ton of stuff. He's an elf. He's in Barton Fink. He tells Trask. Then they are living here. Peacefully. After what happened in Cuba? Obviously, that's about the events that happened at the end of First Class in Cuba. It's just kind of odd that this government is still skeptical about mutants' existence, but, you know, maybe Charles has been using Cerebro to brainwash humanity as he did with Moira. The dissertation that Trask reads to the senators outlines how the emergence of Homo sapiens led to the extinction of the less evolved Neanderthal ancestors, and this was written by Charles, and we saw him read part of it to Raven in First Class. It also reminds us of Storm's lecture in the museum in X2. Okay, on to Saigon. A disguised mystique goes to release the quarantine mutants for you Uniform reads Sanders, and this person's rank is Colonel, Colonel Sanders. Yeah, Mystique is smelling of a lavender some spices. We see a young ink, and then this one with quills on his head might be Evan Daniels, aka Spike from the X-Men Evolution TV show, although his power set in this film is different. Like, he kind of causes people to pass out. Could just be a random spiky mutant they created. Lucas Till is back as Havoc from First Class, and Mystique gives him a wink because back in First Class they were still friends. There's also a young Toad who's given a little redesign here to look more like he did in the comics. Young William Stryker shows up, this time played by Josh Hellman. The Colonel Sanders actor is yet another performer who gets to play themselves as Mystique would be, and he just kind of carries himself with a bit of femininity. While in first class, Mystique wasn't much of a fighter, now she acrobatically takes everyone down as a Rebecca Romaine era would. Now, if this would be part of the normal X-Men timeline before this movie altered it, would this mean the Brian Cox version of Stryker remembered this fight with Mystique? That could explain why he sniffed out Mystique when she was posing as Wolverine in the Alkali Lake scene in X2, and he's like, I always know my own work. But since Origins showed a Vietnam era William Stryker played by Dan Annie Houston, I think we're just not meant to see those histories as the same. This movie just has some of the most interesting refrigerator logic. That's kind of a term that means plot holes don't bother you as you're watching a movie, but when you get up from the couch and you go in the refrigerator to grab a drink, suddenly those plot holes creep into your head. But this movie gets around that by ending in a way that retcons the events of X-Men Origins, so we don't really care about the Hellman versus Houston issue. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. We've all got goals, better work-life balance, stress management, being more optimistic, but figuring out how to tackle big goals like that on your own can be difficult. Connecting with a licensed therapist through BetterHelp can help. BetterHelp makes starting therapy easier and less intimidating for a lot of people. The right therapist for you might not be in your area, and some people struggle with the face-to-face -face interaction of therapy. With BetterHelp, you can have your therapy sessions as a phone call, as a video chat, or even via instant message, whatever's the most comfortable version for you. BetterHelp has over 30,000 therapists in their network to choose from. To get started, you simply fill out the questionnaire that will ask you about what challenges you're going through and what kind of therapist you'd like, then BetterHelp will match you with a therapist, and in most cases, it'll take less than 48 hours. Schedule therapy sessions at a time that's convenient for you, and if for any reason you feel like your therapist is not a great fit, you can switch therapists with a click of the button at no additional cost. Join over 4 million people who have used BetterHelp to start living a healthier, happier life. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash newrockstars. Clicking that link helps support this channel, and it gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. Havoc calls her Raven and she responds, that's not my name. Because remember in The Last Stand, she told the FBI interrogator that she doesn't respond to the slave name when he called her Raven. So we're seeing a version of Raven that has spent some time with Eric Lyncher. After the mutants are safely on the plane and she transforms into this female soldier, Mystique's name on her uniform is Biggs because B. Byron Biggs was a comics alias of Mystique. He was a billionaire with real estate all over the world that she would sometimes pretend to be. Logan seeks out Charles in his new overgrown Grey Gardens-esque shuttered school and he forces his way in past Hank who has visibly reverted to his human form by the end of first class, he was still permanently in the blue beast form. So we know something is up. They have this exchange. You and I are gonna be good friends. I just don't know it yet. I like that Logan acknowledges Beast's adult form played by Kelsey Grammer, whom Logan butted heads with in The Last Stand and will show up at the end of this movie. So we see how Charles can walk, but he looks like he's in the Blue Oyster Cult. He sits behind this chessboard, and the position that the board is in is chaotic. The king on the right side is knocked over, which in chess would mean you have resigned. Logan explains the sentinel future, and Charles remembers Logan from his first class cameo. I'm gonna say to you what you said to us then. F*** Now, off was Logan's original scripted line to Charles and Eric in first class, but for one take, Hugh Jackman improvised, go f*** yourself, which is what made it into the final cut. And in the Logan film in 2017, Charles will tell him to f*** off. 
We learn that after Charles was paralyzed and Eric and Raven left, Charles built the school in the labs but became depressed when his students and teachers got drafted. So he started to take Hank's serum to suppress his powers, which Charles shoots up like heroin. Charles keeps a photo of Raven in his room. It's interesting that it's her in her human form, not her natural blue form, because that is how he knew her most of the time when they were together. But obviously she's changed a lot since they parted. Also next to the photo is a big old joint because it's the 70s. He flashes back to when they met as kids in first class. And this memory is what helps him decide to help Logan. Charles says that Eric killed JFK, which is why they're holding him prisoner beneath the Pentagon. It also would explain the magic bullet theory of the JFK assassination, because Eric would have been the one to make it bend midair. This is an idea left over from Matthew Vaughn's version of the film back when he was slated to direct it. And after the X-Men Origins intro paralleled Zack Snyder's Watchmen that same year in that movie's opening montage, we are reminded how that sequence said the comedian killed JFK. Logan says that he knew a mutant who would still be just a kid who could get into anywhere. Originally, the script had Juggernaut being the one that Logan goes to for help, but they changed it in this movie to Quicksilver. And thank God they do. At Trask Industries, Mystique disguises herself as Trask to look at his files. His safe is hidden behind this giant painting of himself giving a robotic leg to an amputee. The ego of this guy. There's even a gold circle behind him resembling a large halo. In the autopsy reports, Mystique discovers the photo of the first mutant has the name G. Furtiber. Janie Furtiber was this movie's set decorator. The second is listed as E. Kefart for Elsa Kefart, who's the art department clerk. But the next photo is of Azazel with his case number listed as 72663. The three sixes there likely not to its devilish appearance. There's also a photo of Angel with only one wing. Oh God, her death date is only one week after the events of First Class. This is awful. Next, we meet this film's breakout star, Peter Maximoff, Evan Peters. We see Maximoff on the mailbox and we know we're in for a treat. I love how there are major wear lines on the welcome mat, which I like is just so worn down because he would come to an immediate stop when he gets there and he would burst to an immediate speed when he leaves. We see how this speedster had just snatched a ton of stuff. There's a poster on the wall for the band Buffalo Springfield. That was a group best known for the song for what it's worth. Stop, hey, what's that sound? Other posters for the Yardbirds and the doors can be seen. There's also a whole bunch of bowling balls, two skateboards on the wall, one red, one green, which are the colors for Wanda's kids outfits, Billy and Tommy. There's a stolen parking meter. There's stop signs. There's a sign for no parking 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. school days. He's just kind of a hoarder because he's got sticky fingers. And I just love how when we first meet him, we see his powers from others' points of view. He just kind of teleports around. We see him suddenly eating a popsicle. In the next shot, the stick is completely clean. He is always snacking in this movie because he's constantly burning through calories. And notice how whenever there is a Quicksilver sequence, he's always stopping to eat stuff during them. Nothing against the Aaron Taylor Johnson version of Quicksilver in Age of Ultron. I really liked it. You just can't top what Evan Peters does in this movie. So in the comics, Pietro Maximoff is a son of Magneto. And of course, he's the twin brother to Wanda Maximoff. Pietro and Wanda Maximoff were disputed between Fox and Disney because they both wanted to feature them in movies around this time. Age of Ultron was being developed at the same time. They came to an agreement where the MCU could not refer to the characters as mutants or or their lineage to Magneto, and that's why Age of Ultron refers to the characters as enhanced. The X-Men movies, meanwhile, could not reference the Avengers. So they staged this prison break from the Pentagon. Peter goes in as the guard bringing Magneto's food. Notice how Magneto's number is 0001, just as it was in the plastic prison in X2. Just another reminder that he is the first and only prisoner of this place. Peter rapid vibrates the glass to free him. Peter gets Eric out of lockup and he asks him, Take karate? I don't know karate. I know crazy. This is actually a lyric from the James Brown song, The Payback. Peter also says that his mom once knew a guy who can control metal, an obvious nod to the fact that Magneto is his father, and this gets confirmed in X-Men Apocalypse. This brings us to the best sequence of the film, where we enter Peter's powers from his perspective as he listens to Jim Croce's Time in a Bottle. We are literally seeing time in a bottle here, time frozen nearly still in this watery container. Peter runs around the wall in a counterclockwise direction, which is his way of slowing down time. And this sequence I just think works best thematically because it is taking place in a movie about a hero going back in time. The slow motion sequence was filmed using mostly practical effects, VFX in just specific instances of the objects hovering in midair, with of course a mix of high speed photography and stunt rigging. Notice how while Peter sets each guard on a path to knock himself out, he also changes the trajectory of knives and other lethal weapons that would have killed them. He saves their lives. So he's not just a prankster or Bart Simpson, he is a hero even if he doesn't mean to be. These shots here are just incredible. We see this bullet that is slowly piercing a droplet of water. We see the headline on this issue of the Washington Post that Quicksilver knocks over reading Truth Supervisors Belittled by Tew, which refers to South Vietnam's president at the time. There were actually many headlines in 1973 about when he was going to accept a ceasefire agreement. But while his priority is screwing with all the guards, it's almost an afterthought that Quicksilver saves his friends. So he just slightly redirects the bullets that are headed to Charles and Eric, but he waits till the very end to move the bullet that is headed right for Eric's face, as if he's considered letting his absent pop 
die. Just this sequence right here might be one of the all time greatest displays of a superhero's power in any superhero movie because we cut to it both from the perspective of the hero and just the dumbfounded perspective of the people he saved. X-Men Apocalypse will try to recreate it by just making this really over the top, but I think this one is just so contained and it's so elegant. Now on the jet, there's another newspaper, the Washington Senate. The headlines are peace treaty to be signed in Paris. The international agreement will end war in Vietnam and unemployment rate at 4.9%. Logan stabs a newspaper to stop Eric from taking it. And Eric says, imagine if they were metal. Now Logan doesn't have to imagine because according to Brian Singer, future Magneto will turn these claws metal. We learned that Emma and Banshee are also dead. Remember the last time we saw Banshee, he had stayed with Charles, but I guess he left to go to Eric's side at some point. They get into a fight, which causes the plane to chaotically shake through the air. They do some cool camera work here as Eric is shouting. It looks like he's getting taller and the sound exaggerated. They did the same kind of thing when the Lord of the Rings Fellowship, Gandalf, Ian McKellen, who's old Magneto, yells down at Bilbo. Later, Eric makes a peace offering to Charles in the form of a chessboard, asking him if he fancies the game. No matter what these two have been going through over the years, they always connect over a game of chess. But here, Charles turns him down, unwilling to find common ground just yet. Eric reveals that he didn't kill John F. Kennedy. The bullet curved because he was trying to save Kennedy, because Kennedy was a mutant. According to Simon Kimberg, JFK's mutant ability is hypnotic charm. Eric's confession causes Charles to let his guard down, and the two bond over their desire to help Mystique. And after an apology, Charles agrees to a game with Eric. Eric says, quote, it might finally be a fair fight. And it's interesting that them playing chess together has always involved a level of trust, because theoretically, Charles could be reading Eric's mind the whole time, but he doesn't, because it's more interesting for him that way, which just kind of reflects his relationship with Eric Lyncher. Eric moves the E4 pawn with his powers, calling back the scene of him testing out whether his powers have come back at the end of X-Men The Last Stand. Onto Paris, the Vietnamese generals are partying in a club with a lot of pretty girls, reminiscent of the club atomic scenes with the American generals in first class. Similarly, Mystique masquerading as a pretty blonde and seducing a man in a bar is something that she did in X2, and her foot to the throat attack is also something that she did when she objected Senator Kelly in the first X-Men film on the helicopter. At the Paris summit, there is a mix of handheld Zapruder style shots and old school looking news footage. Singer really uses the tools of the decade here very successfully, more so than some of the past time period films of the franchise. The painting Liberty leading the people decorates the wall of the meeting room, which could potentially represent the Vietnamese winning the war or to Trask, the threat to mutants overthrowing humanity. When they realize that there's a mutant in the room, Trask says, no, don't shoot it, it, like they're animals to him. And whereas Charles calls her Raven, when they catch up to her, Eric uses Mystique as that was her mutant name. And we saw earlier that she prefers that. Logan recognizes Stryker and his consciousness starts to slip and he flashes back to scenes from X2. So really this movie wants us to remember past X-Men films. Kitty struggles to hold on to him and she gets a slash from his claws. In the Rogue cut, this was going to lead to them having to rescue Rogue from the X-Mansion to fill in for Kitty. In this movie, Kitty just kind of like holds on. Mystique jumps from the window, but cannot escape Eric's magic bullet. Brian Singer has a quick cameo here as one of the guys holding the camera. There's also a cameo from Newton Thomas Siegel, cinematographer for all the Brian Singer X-Men movies as a guy with a hat and glasses that Mystique turns into to escape. As President Nixon asks what they're dealing with, he adds off the record. And an aide switches off the recorder, which is a reference to the missing section of the Watergate tapes. There's also a shot of his three dogs, Pasha, Vicky, and King Timaho, and they're all perfectly cast. Now Checkers, which is Nixon's famous dog, thanks to the infamous Checkers speech, actually never lived in the White House since Checkers passed away four years before Nixon was elected president. That was back when Nixon was vice president during the Eisenhower years. Trask tells the room of very important people. She could walk into this office and order a nuclear strike if she was in the mood. This is the same fear mongering technique that Senator Robert Kelly will use years later when he asks the Senate what's to stop a little girl who can walk through the walls from walking into the White House. Now, one of the dogs barks at Trask's, and I'm not positive, but this could be a little nod to the first episode of the animated series when a little dog barks furiously at one of the Sentinels. I don't know, it could just be because dogs can sense evil. As Trask examines Mystique's blood, it transforms in a similar way that her skin and her hair do. He refers to this creature as extraordinary, which is similar to how Hank reacted in first class when he was studying her genetic makeup, which is just, you know, gross. Trask asks Stryker about his son, Jason, and Stryker says that he's almost 10. In X-Men Origins, we saw Jason being kept in ice, and he looks like he was maybe between 10 and 12 there. But yeah, we just don't forget that William Stryker is doing all this despite having a mutant son. We see a more advanced version of Cerebro than in first class, but still not as far along as it would be in the first film. Charles cannot handle the influx of thoughts that he's bombarded by. Young Charles looks into Logan's mind and he sees the events of the past films, but then he looks into Logan's consciousness in the future and comes face to face with his older self. And it is awesome. Because someone stumbles, loses their way, it doesn't mean they're lost forever. Yes, this line was so good that it was brought back in Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Just because someone stumbles and loses their way doesn't mean they're lost forever. 
And again, I don't think that the 838 universe is this same universe, but rather this is just kind of a constant that all Charles's say to lost wayward souls. Kind of like their version of with great power comes great responsibility. Now in the rogue cut version of this film, this is where we would get the alternate storyline because the wounds that Wolverine gave Kitty Pride earlier are now taking their toll. So Charles, Eric, and Bobby decide to go free Rogue who would be held at the old X mansion. But in the theatrical cut, Eric uses his powers to get onto Trask trains and hijack the Sentinels. Basically Trask designed them without a scrap of metal, but Eric uses the metal railroad tracks to build the robots with metal. It's pretty cool. Charles uses Cerebro to find Mystique at an airport and talk her through several random people who all seem very shook after he releases them. Hank tells the others that he needs to show them something and it cuts to a scene from the Star Trek episode, The Naked Time that Hank left on the TV. Between this and Sanford and Son, our man loves to watch TV. This was actually an episode of Star Trek where the crew of the Enterprise gets infected by something that lowers their inhibitions and causes them to act crazy. But at the end of the episode, the crew does a full power restart of the warp engines, which causes them to travel 71 hours back in time. So this is when the crew first discovers that time travel is possible, which comes into play in later episodes and iterations. And in fact, the finale of Star Trek The Next Generation involves like a multiple timeline plot, which inspired Kevin Feige to use time travel in Avengers Endgame. But I will say the way time travel works in this movie makes more logical sense than what we see in Avengers Endgame. I will go to my grave saying that, even though Avengers Endgame is probably a better movie at the end of the day, the timeline logic does not make sense in that movie, but it does kind of make sense here. It's just why I love type seven. It's just natural, it's organic, and it confines the time travel logic within our minds. Now in the road cut, a sequence shows the future Professor X helping Iceman and Magneto sneak into the old X mansion, which is now a Department of Defense facility. This is where they got DNA to give the Sentinels the ability to absorb mutant abilities. So really it would kind of cut back and forth between that and the younger Eric Lyncher going to get his helmet back, which is just fitting because they are sneaking into facilities to retrieve this kind of golden goose. So Magneto and Iceman find Rogue and Iceman touches her so she absorbs some of his energy in order to heal and to wake up, but they're attacked by Sentinels as they try to escape and Iceman is killed. Professor X, Magneto get Rogue back and then from here forward, she absorbs Kitty's powers and takes over for her with keeping Logan's consciousness in the past. And it would have been awesome because we would have gotten this moment where Anna Paquin and Hugh Jackman would be back together again. It's just such a bummer that they removed this from the movie because we don't get as great of an end for Iceman and Anna Paquin was top build for this movie. We were all excited to see her again. So it's just a bummer that they weren't kept in the theatrical cut. And it's why I will always recommend watch the road cut. Now the vault in the Pentagon that Charles breaks into to get his helmet back also has some first class remnants on display. You can see the one of Angel's wings that was taken off as well as Havoc's damaged uniform and the coin that Magneto used to kill Sebastian Shaw. Charles, Logan and Hank head to Washington. And in the future, the Sentinels catch up to the free mutants, which makes the ticking clock tick even faster. Because as Kitty Pratt explained earlier, Logan is just kind of asleep. So it's not just like time travel in the past is instantaneous for the future. Since it's all within Logan's mind, it's happening in real time for both timelines. So in the past timeline, Logan walks through the metal detector and he's ready for it to go off like it always does. But he looks surprised back when it doesn't because he's still just all bones. A deleted scene would have shown Charles in his wheelchair seated next to a veteran in a wheelchair and the vet would ask Charles what happened to him and Charles would respond, friendly fire, which would of course be a reference to how Eric accidentally deflected the bullet into Charles at the end of first class. Now during his speech, President Nixon quotes Oppenheimer to reveal the Sentinels. Behold, the world will never be the same again. I mentioned it last week's breakdown of the Wolverine. Perhaps the most important historical figure from the 20th century was J. Robert Oppenheimer. Truly, all of history changed with that guy. Really, they should have sent Wolverine back in time to like Los Alamos to tell everyone to stop doing that. And then like 10 years before that to the scientists in Germany who first created vision and be like, hey, don't do that. So Eric turns the hijacked Sentinels against the humans, which would be similar to the plot of the first run of the Ultimate X-Men where Sentinels are sent to slaughter the inhabitants of Magneto's Savage Land Enclave. Magneto reprograms them to only attack humans and sets them loose on Washington, DC. We start quick cutting between the Sentinel attack in the past and the Sentinel attack in the future. The warnings of Professor X in the opening of this movie that we might be destined on this path are now coming true and we're all terrified. We can't escape it. A cutscene would have shown past Logan snapping out of his consciousness and attacking Hank because he suddenly forgot who he was. Nixon is brought down to a secret bunker and Eric pins everyone in around the White House by dropping a freaking stadium around them. You can imagine that like after he ripped up the Golden Gate Bridge and X Men The Last Stand, they're like, what, what can we have him do this time? Mm, baseball stadium. And then the X Men Apocalypse are gonna be like, all metal everywhere. Meanwhile, in the future timeline, all the mutants are working together to delay the Sentinels as much as possible. And again, you just have to imagine they know they're gonna die. It's just trying to slow them down. Storm powers up Bishop with her lightning and she and Eric blow up the Blackbird in the midst of a group of Sentinels. Some shrapnel from that explosion hits Magneto. So you know he doesn't have much time left. If past Eric Lyncher could see what was happening to future Magneto right now, maybe he'd be rethinking his plans. We need someone who can just talk from the future to the past. Logan, talk, talk. 
talk to them. Also, the irony of it being metal that ultimately does Magneto in just makes it extra tragic. Then Storm is stabbed by Sentinel, and notice how Charles in this moment feels that death. Magneto uses the last of his strength to reinforce the door, and Blink sends him into Charles and Kitty and Logan and Bobby. Bobby, who in this version is just kind of hanging out. Past Eric jams Logan up with a bunch of rebar and zips him down to the Potomac. So now we are terrified. The one man at a time we thought was going to save us is off the board. The shot of the rebar twisting in and out of him is a visual reference to the comics where Magneto removed the adamantium from a skeleton. Ugh. As Logan drowns in the past, he's also kind of drowning in the future. There's this really cool edit where future Professor X hears metal bending. Presumably the Sentinel's trying to get in, but he looks up and it cuts to past Eric. Arms outstretched, manipulating the metal on the White House. Past Eric literally rips the bunker out of the ground and exposes everyone inside. And he does the movie he always loves to do, where he points everyone else's guns back at their owners. As past Eric points the cameras at himself, he makes a speech for all Americans to hear, and the remaining future mutants are just killed in brutal fashion. Bishop literally explodes, Colossus is ripped apart, Warpath is burned alive, and Blink is stabbed. As Sunspot blasts this one Sentinel with his powers, the Sentinel gives itself a diamond exterior. This would be a power it gained from Emma Frost, who was confirmed dead. Then another Sentinel stabs Sunspot with these spindy claws that it presumably gained from Lady Deathstrike. As past Eric continues his speech, Ms. Maximoff watches on TV horrified, since this is obviously Peter's father. Peter's younger sister sits on his lap watching TV with him. This little girl will grow up to be the mutant Polaris, but in the deleted scene of this movie, from the road cut, this little girl is told by her mom to go bug her older sister, and this would have been Wanda she was referring to. And past Eric's fiery speech gives way to a future Magneto's weak and dying last words. All those years wasted. Fighting each other. It's so sad. And we're reminded of Ian McKellen's soul speech in Two Towers, where he talks about all the past years of his life that he wasted. Ian McKellen is so good at this kind of thing, and we see the two friends grasping hands. Meanwhile, in the past, Mystique poses as Nixon and shoots Eric in the neck, saving all the humans on national TV. But before she can turn around and kill Trask, Charles is a hero. He freezes everyone and tells her that he has faith in her. And as she makes her mind up, the future Sentinels break free and kill Bobby. Future Professor X raises his arm to shield himself from the Sentinel blast, but past Mystique drops the gun and her decision not to kill Trask erases the future. Moments before that blast was going to vaporize Charles. And it's just so beautiful to see. For once, the linchpin of history is not an assassination, a bullet curved the wrong way, but rather a change of heart and a decision to not pull the trigger. Now, deleted scene would have shown Nixon ordering Trask's arrest and remarking that mutants are not as bad as he was led to believe. Logan wakes up in a new timeline in Charles' school to the same song he woke up in 1973, the Roberta Flack song. The first mutant he sees is actually the same young mutant scavenger from the beginning who was killed by the Sentinel. The kid made it. Then he sees Rogue. In the regular theatrical version, this would be the only time she appeared on screen. In this timeline, she and Bobby are still together. Hank walks by and says, good morning, Logan. Kelsey Grammer's back in the role for the first time since The Last Stand. And yes, Storm is alive as well. All the sound stops as we hear Logan's breathing amped up. <gasps> These cameos by Famke Jansen and James Marsden were considered the most crucial to keep secret at the time, and it was such a shock and a beautiful reveal that they're alive again. We learned that Logan is a professor of history, which is just perfect. And it's just so crazy to think that Charles was basically hanging out with Logan all these years, knowing that at some point his alternate history mind would just cosmically merge with his current mind and he'd need to have the blanks filled in. And again, what's so elegant and beautiful about this film is all the secrets of the past are just contained within the minds of these two mutants. Like Marty McFly waking up at the end of the Back to the Future to finding himself in an alternate happy ending, which this movie's ending is totally referencing. And instead of Marty and Doc, it's Wolverine and Professor X. Now in the past, Logan is fished out of the water by who we think is Stryker, but it's actually Mystique. They do the whole stupid yellow eyes thing again. I'm assuming Logan still had the Weapons Plus procedure done on him in this timeline. It's never really clear where it goes from here. I mean, in X-Men Apocalypse, he's in the Alkali Lake facility, but like, why would he be there if he was with Mystique? In an alternate ending, it would have actually been Stryker who fished him out, but they want to do something weird with Mystique and we never really know what. So essentially, in this movie's Alter 2023, the events of X-Men The Last Stand did not happen, but since Jean Grey is alive, neither did X2. Or maybe they did happen, they just happened in alternate timelines that were no longer on. Meanwhile, in the past, since we saw a different path for Wolverine and Stryker, we're to assume that X-Men Origins would have been erased as well. But for a moment, when this movie came out, the future of the X-Men franchise looked as bright as the MCU. A future timeline with all of our favorites back together again, and a past timeline with younger heroes that could blaze its own destiny on its own timeline. But other than Logan and the Deadpool movies, right here, this would be the last good X-Men film. And that includes a crazy post credit scene where we see a young Insabon 
Ner, Apocalypse, the very first mutant, and all of his worshippers in ancient Egypt as he assembles the pyramid. And then over on the hill behind him are the four horsemen. This obviously would lead to X-Men Apocalypse, where we meet the past four horsemen, and then he recruits a new four horsemen lineup from the roster of X-Men. But in the Rogue cut, an alternate post credit scene would have showed Trask being kept in the Pentagon in Magneto's old cell. This moment here is as cool as Insabon Ner will look, nothing against Oscar Isaac, it's just they did some crazy things with him, as we'll get to in a couple weeks. But next week, we'll be breaking down 2016's Deadpool. And since that Deadpool and Wolverine trailer came out, I know you're all gonna wanna watch that breakdown. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Boss, follow New Rockstars, and subscribe to New Rockstars for more analysis of everything you love. Thanks for watching, bye.